Welcome to another session on Cultural Studies. This time, we will be looking at Simon During's Introduction to Cultural Studies. Simon During is a New Zealander, had his education at the University of Cambridge and later went on to teach at Melbourne University. He was also for some time at John Hopkins University and Princeton. His areas of study are mainly media and film. He has umpteen number of books on various subjects. Foucault and Literature was published in 1991. His in-depth study on Patrick White, the Nobel Prize winning Australian author, was published in 1994. Modern Enchantments was published in 2002. Exit Capitalism in 2009. And the Cultural Studies Reader in 99. Cultural studies is not an academic discipline because it does not have a well-defined methodology or clear-cut areas of investigation. To be precise and simple, it is study of contemporary culture. Culture can be analyzed in many ways, sociologically, by studying its institutions and functions, economically, by understanding the economic links to the cultural, or critically especially of literature, by studying expressive forms like specific texts, images, etc. In the 1950s, cultural studies was subjective. That is, culture was seen in relation to human lives. Richard Hoggart's the Uses of Literacy, published in 1957, is a personal work which looks at changes in working class culture in post-war Britain. The work is mostly his own experiences and how a person's whole way of life was influenced. Culture is important because it helps to understand that one's life practice, for example, reading, is not isolated from working, family life, sexual attitudes, etc. Cultural studies accepts that societies and individuals are unequal in existence and people do not have equal access to the various amenities in the world and one cannot be silent about it. Something must be done about it and therefore it becomes entirely different from literary criticism which thought Political questions were not very important and only appreciation of literature was relevant. One should understand that culture and high culture are not the same. Raymond Williams 
in his classic work, Culture and Society, published in 1958, argues that culture and society should not be separated. Similarly, culture and high culture also should not be seen differently. But whenever there is a separation, culture becomes more vibrant and informative. The effects of cultural studies is important at the level of individual life. Most individuals aspire and struggle in life. They are not engaged in just interpreting texts. They have to think of reading itself as a life practice. At this point, it is very important to understand or question, how did cultural studies enter into higher education? And for this, one must know the historical conditions which led to the discipline. And for this, the evolution or history of cultural studies becomes important. In Great Britain, the 1950s was named after F.R. Lewis, a great scholar, and his theories were called Levicism. And F.R. Lewis wanted to spread cultural capital through education. And this concept of cultural capital was made very intense and popular later by the theorist Pierre Bourdieu. The school of F.R. Lewis disregarded the avant-garde experimental sort of writing. They in fact discarded T.S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf, etc. They preferred the moral sensibility of Jane Austen, Pope, George Eliot, etc. who together formed the great tradition. Culture is not just leisure. For example, reading from the great tradition helps to create mature, balanced individuals. But the main threat to this formation is the pleasure offered by the new mass culture. Both Levisites and cultural studies speaks of a social democratic power block in post-war Britain. At this point, the government started intervening even in the private sector, especially the social, which included health, housing, etc., and culture, which included education and the arts. When education expanded in the 50s and 60s, it was Levicism that helped to form ideal sensibilities and, to a certain extent, ideal citizens. The evolution of cultural studies can be traced through Lewis, Hoggart, Williams, etc. And their writings became part of the curriculum in secondary schools 
and colleges. Both Hogarth and Williams participated in workers' education. They agreed that canonical texts were richer than mass culture, as it is very important that culture should widen and deepen experiences. Hogarth's important work, Uses of Literacy, is a rather strange or schizophrenic work because it faces a double bind or a dilemma. In the work, Hogarth evokes the working class in a nostalgic tone. He speaks of the pristine experiences of the working class. But at the same time, he goes on to attack modern mass culture. So when Hogarth became part of the CCCS, it became one of his functions or duties to deal with this binary or tension. Hogarth goes on to celebrate the old high culture of his youth, which is under threat. He asks a very pertinent question. Has the disappearance of the British working class in a way led to the birth of cultural studies? In the 1920s, there was unemployment in Great Britain. By 1940s, there was full employment. And by 50s, there were tremendous changes. Large factories had emerged, especially in the Fordist assembly line pattern. And this it is believed led to de-skilled labor and a sort of alienation. There was no difference between white and blue collar jobs. There was immigration from colonies and therefore the job market was more flexible and open. The workers became more refluent they had more purchasing power, they had cars, washing machines, refrigerators, telephones, there was housing program, there was scheme for higher education for the working class and there was a big break from the old culture. And the old canonical idea that culture is a whole way of life was not very easy to maintain. Because locally produced cultural forms like pub life, group singing, etc. gave way to dances, holiday camps, seaside resorts, etc. And it is at this point that later Adorno and Hockheimer would speak of the birth of the culture industry. Paddy Vanel and Stuart Hall, through their work Popular Arts, published in 1964, argues that at this point, art forms like jazz, films, music, 
etc. become canons. TV and rock lost its old status and glory. And also it is very important to understand that at this point culture is not anymore apart from politics. E. P. Thompson in his classic English Working Class, published 1968, argues that the identity of working class has political and conflictual elements together. This is not just cultural, but the breakdown of working class culture meant insignificance of working class identity. People stopped seeing themselves as mere workers and therefore cultural theorists started looking at culture's political function and they went on to critique power centering on the state because by 70s culture was seen as a form of hegemony a sort of domination which is not visible the subaltern knowingly or unknowingly consents or gives consent to this domination Gramsci, in fact, in his works, says that even fascism was very popular at a specific point during the time of Mussolini, although everyone was aware that it controlled freedom. This is hegemonic power. And these hegemonic forces constantly change and improvise. And therefore, counter-hegemonic forces too are forced to change their strategies. Foucault says, one can argue that in a subtle way, Culture is a form of governmentality and this governmentality produces docile systems and this is achieved mostly through the educational system. Culture is seen as an apparatus for domination and so Cultural studies gives critiques of culture's hegemonic effects. At first, this critique went only for a semiotic analysis of messages, signifying practices, discourses, etc both in institutions and the media. As an example, during takes an analysis of cigarette smoking among workers and he takes the example of the Marlboro man. The Marlboro cigarette brand was very popular during the period 1954 to 1999. This filter cigarette was actually meant for women. 
it had this catchy phrase, mild as may, but then it did not appeal to the macho and the masculine. So then Leo Burnett, who made this advertisement, he decided to go for a rugged cowboy advertisement. And from then on, the Marlboro advertisement or the Marlboro man represented masculinity, freedom, etc. But during argues that the analysis of cigarette smoking was not analyzed as a life practice. So the role of semiotics was limited to just codings and recodings. In the 70s, under the influence of theorists like Louis Althusser, Lacan, etc. Individuals were seen as constructs of ideology or common sense. This can be seen as a structuralist notion. Ideology in a way helps to overcome the threat of revolution. The dominant ideology constructs an imaginary picture of civil life, nuclear family, the unique and free individual, etc. Ideology lures people, it tempts people because it helps them to get a sense of the world. Ideology helps them to enter the symbolic order of power. Sometimes in their fantasy, they feel like being the Marlboro man or something like the Marlboro man. People see themselves as part of dominant ideology and they take on the image of the father figure and thus escape fear of castration. But slowly the individual understands that there is no real autonomy. Ideology provides the understanding that no symbolic structure can give final meaning or security. There is only a lure. There is no promise of fullness. But one can understand that the theory of structuralism was not very strong in cultural studies as in film studies. Because basically its claims to scientific method did not succeed in cultural studies. And therefore, the concept of polysemy entered into the cultural tradition. When one says that signs are polysemous, it means that one sign can be both syntagmatic and paradigmatic. Example, the Marlboro man represents both masculinity and cancer. And in cultural studies, a sign can have many meanings and therefore it is polysemous. Cultural production is seen as a process of hybridization, reproduction and negotiation. For example, the Marlboro man 
can be made into a postmodern man or a poor man or can be parodied on a CD or album cover. Hybridization helps to create new meanings and so there is renewed culturalism. But meanings are certainly influenced by material interests and power relations. For example, the Marlboro Man or the Marlboro Advertisement for the tobacco industry becomes something related to selling. But for the medical profession, it is related to the promotion of health and to the women's movement, it hints at the rejection of masculinity. Cultural studies is interested in knowing how weak groups read and use cultural products in fun, in resistance or to articulate their own identity.